This is Ham Radio Concepts. It's finished. <laughs> a year I've worked on this project. I think I remember saying, oh, this would be a cool weekend project. Right. You could probably put this together probably a day. Well, it was a learning experience, and I am Eric, KJ4YZ, yeah, you're watching Ham Radio Concepts. I'm gonna show you a little bit about the satellite tracker that I've finished. This is not my design, this is Elwood Downey's design, and the link is in the description. He created this, posted the parts, posted the, the sketch and the Arduino code, and then said, here, build it. Although there's a couple snags, and there's a lot of things you need to know that I didn't know of, being I have never touched Arduino, and some other things that I've never played with before. So I'll show you why I had you know, some struggles and some ideas and helpful hints for you. Also, I wanna thank Roger, Roger H, my buddy in Georgia. This guy answered a lot of calls. He built one uh, and he, he was, you know, oh, Eric, you gotta try this. Oh man, I, I mean, I was ready to smash this thing. I really was, I was ready to break it. And he'd answer the phone and be like, oh, Eric, don't worry about it. Check this, check that, let me know, send me an email, blah, blah. It worked or it wouldn't work. And then we figured it out together. So Roger, thank you for all your time that you've you know, spent with me, that's awesome. The satellite tracker here, um, compared to the very first part one video is a little bit different. And the reason is because I struggled and I actually admit my defeat, I gave up. The original plans for the Arduino with the ethernet shield and the Wi-Fi hotspot, TP link, that's what I told you. I bought all the parts, I showed the links, you probably bought some parts. I never got that working. So. I, I was defeated. And then he had said in the beginning, hey, I saw your very first video, he saw it. And he said, uh, you might wanna go to that updated, you know, ESP8266 version. It's a lot easier, a lot less parts to buy, and it's gonna be on time. And I said, well, I already did this. I already started. So I'm gonna finish it. Then my idea was to make the updated video. Didn't work. I got defeated. So uh, I'll show you the parts that I have over here laying because I did have to buy the parts like four times, and uh, maybe you have those parts, maybe you can get it going and tell me what I did wrong. But this one is a little bit more simple with the ESP8266 design, built-in Wi-Fi, everything is built into it. It's just one little board for $14, uh, and you don't need the ethernet shield and all that. So we'll show you that in a second, I'll show you what it is. And a satellite pass is coming here in moments, AO92, and because it's absolutely pouring outside, I'm gonna see if this thing will track it in my little office here, and if it'll actually hear the satellite through the ceiling uh, with a almost direct overhead pass, we'll see what happens. Just to, you know, my idea is we're, you know, I'll, you know, be out in the field just a lot more playing satellites and uh, uh, getting to use it. So let me show you the satellite tracker and thank everybody for their patience on this. And uh, I, I'm excited now because this thing is actually working. A couple little things I got to tweak, but it's excited. Uh, I'm excited. It's exciting. Let's check it out. So the antenna here is the Elk Log Periodic Dual Band. Okay, it's, it, it's great. It, all these elements unscrew, the pieces come apart, goes right in a portable bag so you can take this thing with you. Uh, use it handheld, very light, or use it on a tracker like this. And again, the Log Periodic versus a Yagi is you have unity gain. So the SWR and the uh, bandwidth is from one end of the band to the other with a couple dB of gain less than a Yagi. Yagi focuses wherever it's tuned, that's where all your gain is. And as you move away from that center frequency on a Yagi, you lose gain. But this one's got the same amount of gain across. So really good. Now the SO239 is in the front, or the feed point, this is your front of your antenna. And I would recommend not putting on, um, you know, LMR400 or RG8 or something big, because that's gonna weigh down the, the um, the antenna. So what I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to get some RG213, that small stuff, because the satellite, you're really, trust me, with five watts, even at that little coax at a short run, it's not going to lose that much loss. Satellites, you can work with one watt if you want to. So I'll put the RG213, and I'll probably get it, you know, with Velcro straps down this way against the boom. And that way I could use it out in the field with a handheld and not have all the weight of a heavy coax pulling on this. Because while this thing will center itself, you pull it down, it's going to try to you know, it's gonna try to correct itself, keep it straight. You don't wanna put that much strain on it. But uh, the antenna, as you've seen in the house, uh, works really well. So what's the deal with the electrical tape? Well, 
uh, that's just temporary just to play with this in the house for now. What I have to do is this, uh, the, the PVC that goes into here and up into here, it's a little loose, all right? So when this thing, if I hit go to 90 or 45, it, it flips back real hard and it throws the antenna out. So maybe a couple hose clamps, but then again, let me explain about the hose clamps here. You see this sensor right here? And I have it hot glued on there, but that's your nine degrees of freedom sensor. That's your gyrometer or magnetometer, however you want to call it. That's the thing like in your iPhone, you know, when you flip the screen sideways or you use the compass or the level app in your iPhone, it knows which way it's facing and this and that. So that's, that right there uh, should not be close to metal, okay, because it throws it off. And that, that's what uh, one thing Roger told me. So if you look inside here, I have the metal, you know, bolt. And I also have the gears that are metal. So I might need to either A, get a nylon bolt in the middle because it throws it off a little bit. If you notice, the orientation of the gimbal, okay, versus the orientation of my boom is turned a little bit. Why? Because I've noticed that I'm like nine, 10 degrees off. And so what I gotta do is I, I get the thing calibrated and I go to 180 degrees, I check it with a compass, and then I align my boom with 180 degrees. Shouldn't have to do that. Um, but I'm thinking that it has to do with my sensor in relation to where the bolt is or the metal under here. You could also put it up here. But the reason I didn't was because I wanted this thing to be like a modular design I could take apart. So I could actually take this antenna off right here, take the thing apart, put it in the bag. That's one piece. The whole bottom section here like this from, from here to here is another piece. That's two. And then the tripod with the box on and everything is three. So I can take it apart in three different sections. If I permanently attach this to the boom up here, uh, it's going to keep it to where I can't take the antenna off if I hot glue it or something. I don't want to keep going through zip ties and all that. Uh, another thing is this can be affected, the sensor, by the RF coming off the antenna. So if you put it here and you're transmitting, probably not a good idea. Okay, uh, That's just what I've, I've learned from there and my flare of my green and two-tone green and black wire loom, uh, you know, just to keep it a little nicer looking, but also Roger had mentioned. Uh, and, and of course, Elwood had it running through the gear of the servo here. So I originally had this thing coming out of here and going up, but it, if you don't, you know, watch it, be careful, it sandwiches right in here in those gears and that, that crunches and those gears got some torque, man. You don't want to stick your finger in there. I already got it once by accident. Those gears got some torque, so, uh, you know, but uh, that's so far uh, that part. Now, my idea for the battery, uh, I'm using a bio -NO. This is the uh, 6 amp hour. I have the 12 amp hour on charge over there, which I was laying up here temporarily. Now, oh, let me get down here. I'm not sure exactly what I want to do with this yet. My idea in the beginning was, oh, cool, this thing's going to fit in this box. Didn't work. Uh, the battery's a little too big for the box. So, what I'm going to do is in order to keep it, you know, movable and portable, I'm gonna take some Velcro straps, all right? And I'm gonna affix it like this probably, let's see. Okay, something like this, Velcro straps with the wire loom, you know, over, over the, the wires here. And this way it's not permanent, but I could take it off. I could, you know, pull the Velcro things off, take it off and repurpose this for another ham radio. Some people said, you know, keep that to where you can take it off. And I might do that, see? If I just Velcro it there when I'm done, I unzip it, put it on charge, whatever. Uh, I thought about permanently doing it like on the inside or something here, but then I wouldn't be able to fold the tripod up. Right now the tripod folds up. So in the meantime, that's where that sits right there. It kind of sits good there, but you know, if that thing, whoop, it's gonna yank the wire off. I really don't wanna do that. So the bio -NO seems to provide a lot of power. The difference between the, the bigger bio -NO and this one uh, as far as, you know, the servos moving, like when this antenna is all the way down and it's got to use the torque to bring it up. Uh, I don't notice the difference between the big one and the small one. Um, I'm sure the big one would have more current and runtime, but the servos still, when you have the antenna all the way down, you know, 90 degrees facing up, it still struggles to get up. Um, so, but again, when you see me playing with it and inputting the override values, that's going fast. When it's tracking, it's going very slow, one degree at a time. So it does good, you know, that way. 
So let's look at a box in here. So this is, uh, you know, that Amazon project box and it's got the clear gasket around it. I wouldn't use this in the rain, but it at least keeps the dust and everything out of there. So there's my um, Espressif ESP8266, the Adafruit Ultimate GPS breakout with the antenna because I have the antenna from the other GPS um, that didn't end up working. So I stuck it on this one. Helps out for the lock, uh, even indoors. I have a power pole splitter here. So the, the power, you know, coming in and then I could run it. Probably unnecessary, but it made it, you know, a little bit neater. Here I have a 5 volt, you know, 12 volt to 5 volt step down and a 12 volt to 6 volt step down. This one is just for, this is, this right here is just for the servo power, okay? This is your communication, the SDASC or SDASCL to the servo controller, which is in this box right here. And you can see... I used RJ45 and a power pole. So I could take the RJ45s off, take the power pole off, and take this whole top unit out. You know, uh, it's got the wire loom on it, whatever. But um, that's like a design where I can take the thing apart. All right, I got to do something with those there, maybe put some butt splices or something. But that's pretty much it inside the box. There's not much, you know, not much to it. Uh, you can run the GPS off 3.3 volt. You can run the Arduino or the uh, Espressif on 3.3 um, volt. I chose to feed it with the 5 volt, the little USB connector that I cut off and spliced in because I already had that there for my previous attempt with my TP link. So I figured, well, uh, you know, I'll power it off 5 volts. I have enough slack here so I can crank this thing up. But if I really wanted to, I love this tripod. This Sony tripod really is sturdy. Okay. So I can crank that up like that if I really wanted to get it up in the air. Don't know what the advantage of that would be unless I had something in the way. But it's a very, very sturdy tripod. All the parts, again, the list uh, of parts are in the first video and on this video. But those are uh, most everything except the servos were purchased on Amazon and the battery came from uh, BioNO because those are like the by far the best uh, portable batteries for ham radio and everything out in the field. And with this bio window there, I could also use my solar charge controller and solar panel out in the field. If I had five, six passes, I could lay the solar panel out with the charge controller, feed the battery, keep that thing charged if I wanted to. Regarding the connections, hot glue is your friend. And I did solder the connections onto the board. Why? Why did I do that instead of using the header pins? Because I got tired of the, uh, you know, Chinese... Uh, Breadboard pins not making a good connection. I soldered it when I knew it was good and I tested it. I hot glued it and that way it's never coming off. The same thing for the sensor right here. You can see when I soldered the Cat5 on there, look, I hot glued it all. That ain't going nowhere. That Gorilla hot glue is some serious stuff. I can get it off if I want to, but uh, it, it keeps it, you know, really solid. So I don't have to worry about when I move this thing around. You know, imagine getting out in the field putting this thing up and finding out shaking in your truck that the connectors are loose you know that'd be no good okay so you see we have the boxo miscellaneous parts and stuff that i've ordered let me show you a couple things okay to start so the original design used arduino megas okay why do i have so many here well all right so this is my original idea or his original idea for phase one ethernet shield right which is a separate, you know, gives you ethernet, which would go to your battery powered router or your portable router, which I had, I'll show you here in a second, in the original design. So this ethernet shield goes on here, okay? And this is a SunFounder Arduino. The problem I had originally, what started this whole catastrophe was when I ordered these little jumpers, the Chinese Amazon $6 for 300 of them. These were trash, okay? and you know, I don't want to say all the China stuff that you can get on Amazon is trash, but let me tell you what. You know, you come with a lot of them, and I thought it was a good value. And I said, well, you got male, male, you know, female, female, male, female. So I figured, okay, cool. You know, I'll take this, and we'll stick it in the, you know, stick it into this like this, right? And then you run it over to the GPS. No. Nope. Took me two weeks to figure out that a piece of wire like this could actually be a problem. I did not realize it. But, you know, they fit in, I got too much coffee, I'm shaking too bad. Let's see here. Okay, so you see male or female, right? Insert tab A in the slot B. Well, somehow that doesn't work. So I sat there messing with it. Then I thought, okay, 
I got an idea. I'll buy another Arduino. Maybe the Arduino is bad. So that was the first. Here's the first one here. The second one I bought was this. Now I want you to tell me the difference. Okay, I want you to look at these two and tell me the difference. Right, Elegoo. Elegoo did not work at all, okay? So the reason that Elwood said Sunfounder was because this is the one that he felt was working the most reliably. So when the first one went bad, I said, well, or it didn't go bad, I thought it was bad. It would work, it wouldn't work, couldn't get the web interface, could get the web interface, thing would reset, power off, power on. It's because all the pins and stuff were flaky, right? So I got the Elegoo. This thing I spent a week on. I said, there's no way that this little China board here is the problem. Well, it sure was. So I went part three, okay? So now part three, I went for another Sun Founder. Then I said, well, that's weird. Steam Education Sun Founder. They were two different ones again. I said, well, they both say Sun Founder. What's the difference? Well, this is the original one here. This one's number three. So it would start to be flaky again. I said, I got it. That's when I figured out these things. I started soldering. And don't look at this, because this is in the process of testing. This one actually, right here, was the one, you know, the first one I had, <laughs> you could tell my soldering iron went, you know, on the, I, I wasn't doing a good job of soldering. I figured, okay, I got an idea. I'll solder it to the board. That worked. Then I'd solder the GPS. Didn't work. And then it would work. And so that's when number three, it did actually work. Then I hot glued it, hot glued the board in there, and guess what? GPS quit. That was GPS number two. All right, so I don't have the ones I threw away, but then I said, let me get another GPS. Now, th this is the one that I was ordering, the Adafruit Arduino GPS, okay? Um, ultimate breakout. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe, you know, the GPS just quit. And those are $36 a piece. So then I went like this. I said, I got an idea. I'm gonna get this GPS. This one is the Ublox Neo 6M for like $12. And I researched online and figured you know, I soldered the header pins in and I figured, well, why wouldn't this work? That's when I started getting into libraries on an Arduino. You know, the libraries are written for the, the GPS that he put in there. So this one used a whole different library. That's when that whole catastrophe started. Finally, I got the library right, and this thing would not communicate still. That's when I gave up and said, I mean, now you're talking all this I just said in three minutes turned into six months uh, with the time I had. So this GPS does seem to work, but just not with this project. So I'll hold on to that. But you can see I soldered the pins on there, you know, soldered them on to make sure that the China thing wasn't flaking out. So your best bet is to go with the Adafruit Arduino Ultimate, or the Adafruit Ultimate GPS Breakout. That's the one I have in there right now. So when I went to the second uh, version without using all these Arduinos, okay, these Megas, I went with the Espressif uh, ESP8266. Okay, and this is number two because here's, here's another thing. In Elwood's design, he said use the Huzza, uh, what is this called, Feather. ESP8266, okay, Adafruit. Now, $16. What I did was I saved four bucks and I waited a week longer to get the, what's it called? High Let Go. This is how the, there's the, the label there. High Let Go. And I thought, how can this be any different? It's the same thing. Wrong. This ESP8266 essentially does the same thing, but the pin markings are totally different. Pin number 12 or GPIO 12 is in a totally different spot than the high let go. So that, mine actually is working. The high let go will work. Now, is this a more stable Wi-Fi and all that? I don't know. My Wi-Fi seems to be working fine. This little board right here has everything in it to replace what you're seeing that I was already messing with. I mean, it's got the Wi-Fi on it. You can load the code onto it. You can power it several different ways. Bluetooth on it. And it's even got the header pins and, you know, this right here. Integrated Wi-Fi, 4 megabyte flash, 80 megahertz, and 3.3 volt. So this is probably the best option. But if you do go with the high let go, and I don't know where China comes up with high let go, yes, it will work too. Just make sure that you start looking, you know, when you upload to the board in the Arduino Sketch uh, IDE, you have to choose 
the uh, generic ESP8266, not the Huzza Adafruit, because you'll get errors. And not only that, with this right here, you're gonna have to go in and figure out and learn that the code that was originally written by the creator uses older libraries than what you're gonna get from the current Arduino IDE. That was another problem. I didn't realize that the, the you know, versions would come up when he sent me a screenshot and he said, this is what mine says when I compile. And I looked at it and it said version 1.0, version 1.8, and all mine were like version two, version four, because Arduino wants to keep you updated, but the code that he used and the libraries he used are much older. So I had to delete all those libraries that I updated and find on GitHub the older libraries so that this thing would compile with what I needed. And I've already forgot half of what I've done, but I remember that specifically. Another month went by that this wouldn't work, and that's why I ordered this. I said, well, I guess the highlight going ain't gonna work. Turns out when it came, I figured out the library version mismatches. So this board is good. I don't need to use it, but it's a spare, or I'll give it to somebody who I see locally that wants to build one, I don't know. So that's the way you wanna go. If you got yours running with this, and the ethernet shield, and ethernet to the TP-Link hotspot, and all that stuff, let me know, because I tried everything, and the thing just would not work. Wouldn't do what I want it to do, wouldn't communicate, error loading boards, error loading this, web interface won't load. So that's uh, your little fun fact. Um, there's a reason that they tell you the Adafruit Ultimate GPS, and there's a reason they tell you the Huzza Adafruit Feather, and there's a reason that they tell you get a real or a Sun Founder, and don't go for the Quan Shang, Elegu, King Kong, whatever uh, board, because although that may work for what you're doing, sometimes you're gonna get a counterfeit, or you're gonna get something that's just not gonna perform like you need it to. I mean, realistically, all these are made in China, but you can see right here, there's a difference between both the Sun Founders that said they were authentic Sun Founders, there's a difference. And I can tell you there's a difference because they loaded differently and they would communicate differently. One was rebooting for no reason. The Elegoo, it would just reboot. I don't know why. In the middle of the thing, it whoop, light start blinking. You had to pull power out. And also, I was feeding mine on 12 volt or I tried feeding it USB 5 volt or I tried feeding it on the board. Just, just didn't work right. So those are your helpful hints there. So here is a spare servo controller that I have the other one mounted in the box. I don't know, 10, 15 bucks. Why do I have this? Oh, that's a really good question. Because the first one, it was another problem. My soldering gun was too hot. Now again, here we go. Eric, you're an idiot for soldering on that. Why do you think they have header pins? Because I bought cheap Chinese breadboard cables. And although this looks really nice, and I commend you for doing it with the breakout like this, that was a flaky connection. Can you believe that? Yeah, it just, it wouldn't work right, okay? So once I soldered it, it worked every time. This one is actually not the one I fried. So this must be number three. But anyways, you can see I had them soldered on there and it, it, it was worked fine, you know? It, of course, then you can see that, oh, what's this wire, Eric? Right, because I had to order some good wire. Now this is another thing. This was like $9, a little what, 24 gauge, 26 gauge, like 50 feet. Now I'll give you permission to order this one from China on Amazon because this, how can you go wrong with a piece of wire? Well, <laughs> I guess you can, <laughs> but this is just raw 12 volt wire. And I use this to everything. So I'd solder this to the GPS. I'd run this for, you know, from the uh, Espressif to the servo controller connections and stuff like that. This actually worked good, cheap. Uh, I wouldn't use this for powering the thing because the servos are gonna draw a little bit of current. So I used bigger wire. Uh, I had some, some wire in my uh, thing down here that was about this size right here. I cut, you know, it was an old power cable from something, a CB radio, and I cut this off. I don't know what that is, 16 gauge, something like that, which delivered more current. Uh, so good to have is this. You could use Cat5, which I have an abundance of if it's stranded, but the solid Cat5 just doesn't like to bend a lot. This stuff's very flimsy, very good. So uh, I, I recommend you get yourself some good wire to solder the connections for when you know you have it working first. Here was the uh, my little TP-Link battery powered router. You can see I had this thing hot glued in. <sighs> Again, no reason to have this when you have 
the espresso that's got Wi-Fi built in. So originally I said buy the, not the battery powered one, but the other one that powered off five volts. And it was a good idea, but this is how this went, right? You had to have, you know, this went on the ETH, you know, on the Arduino like this, and then this would feed onto here. Now what would happen is you'd connect to Wi-Fi here so you could load the interface in your phone or computer, and it would talk to the Arduino. But again, just problems, not with this, but with something, you know, you had to set this up to match the IP and, and I forget now to configure it for, you know, generic IP or modify the code to match this. And sometimes you get these, you can't make it a different subnet or, a, or whatever. So unnecessary, just another piece of hardware that I didn't need. This thing works good as a portable router, but you don't need it. So here's what I do in the beginning, okay? So I have the, the web interface loaded up on my phone and you can see the sensor over here, it says uncalibrated, the spatial sensor. So I run this thing a couple different directions by manually putting in the override here. You see the little boxes, azimuth and elevation. All right, so I'm gonna run the azimuth to uh, zero degrees and you'll see it's gonna see which way should I go Long ways back around to zero, or should I just go the quickest route, depending on the limits that are set, okay? Now, then I'm gonna go 180 degrees out. And it says, no, nope, let's go the other way. And that depends on how you set up that tripod um, and which way, the you know, you get the limits. So it needs to know where uh, 180 degrees is. I guess if you knew that was 180, you could turn the whole tripod on the bottom and get that thing to where, you know, but, but the sensor does that really for you. And I'll set the, um, let's go the elevation like 25 degrees, right? And then we go 50, and it moves a little quick on the elevation. If you go 90, that thing goes flying back, all right? Let's go 90, all right? Then we'll go back to zero. All right, then I'll go back to 360 degrees on the sensor. Now from my phone, AO92 is four minutes. It's gonna be an 85 degree pass, AO92, so watch. In the uh, web interface here, okay, you can go right here, find the TLE for AO92 at AMSAT, right? Go here to upload. It loads it, all the data in the app, and then hit start tracking, okay? Right now, that's gonna be ready, okay? When that comes up, it's gonna start tracking it. Um, and it'll, you know, you, you have, if you turn off the pop-up blocker, you'll be able to see the, the sky view map here uh, that looks like the, the round thing and in, in, in relation to where you're at. That right now is ready to go in three minutes. Now it's below the horizon. Right now it's actually negative 11 degrees at 9.8 degrees azimuth, and that's where it's facing. And as this satellite starts to come up, it's gonna start tracking it. So I'll show you here what that looks like. What you might notice is, so I have my, I, first of all, I have my little radio here attached to the antenna, and uh, that's in case I actually hear something in my house with an overhead pass. What you notice is it's a little bit rocky, right? A little bit, it twitches a little bit, because I think the nine degrees of freedom sensor you know, it's bouncing a little bit and, and it's trying to keep it right on the level. Once you get it where it's got a, it's got like a weight to it, you know, where the, the elevation's up and it's, you know, the weight's not keeping it bouncing, it does a little better. Uh, it's because it's right at zero degrees, it's flopping. Now, the satellite right now, okay, so AO92, 1.74 degrees elevation, two degrees, so it's coming up at 10 degrees azimuth. And what you see here is it's starting to follow it. Very simple, right? It's, it's uh, not a simple project, what I mean, but um, it's, it's doing what you want it to do. Now, again, you see the, I wonder if that can be adjusted or possibly, uh, you know, uh, buffered a little bit so that it's not so twitchy like that. Another thing is you don't want to have something like this radio next to the sensor up here because that's a magnet, magnetomic or magnetic sensor and it's probably throwing it off. But as you'll see, when this thing starts going up a little bit, uh, it's going to steady out a little more. And uh, the azimuth is still a nine. It's going to be almost a direct overhead pass from the north, just about north, northeast. So this thing should go all the way almost facing up at 85 degrees max elevation. This thing's actually hearing 
I'm actually hearing the satellite through my roof. Let's listen. Holy cow, look at that. Now see, in order for it to go almost straight up, it pretty much turned around. And that might be uh, what I need to address with the uh, limits, you know. It, it, it said, well, right when it got to about 60 something degrees, instead of staying, it, it sort of turned around and tried to get it, you know, the other way. Um, it probably would have been easier, think about it if, it, if the pass is going this way, it's a lot easier than when it goes overhead. All right, so at this point, the pass is already uh, 194 degrees, and that would be 14.82 uh, degrees, so it's coming down. So a little, uh, you heard the people, you know, the, the contacts, the stations through the satellite through my house. It wasn't really the best of being outside, but of course, it's raining outside. Uh, I think one of the, the little things I need to work on is the orientation of this tripod, as well as the limits. So... If I can explain the limits correctly, let's say you can narrow, let's say you can nail this thing down to zero degrees north and it only moved 360 degrees, kind of like your rotator at your house. You know, if you're, if you're at uh, zero degrees north and you wanted to go to 360, it'd be easy just to, or you know, 350, it'd be easy to go 10 degrees this way, but you may not be able to do that. It may have to swing all the way around. If the limit is set at 355 in orientation or relation to the tripod, it might have to say, well, I have to go all the way around to get to 350 because my limit set at 355 this way, if that makes sense. Uh, so the, uh, the pass is almost over. Well, it is pretty much over. It's a seven degrees, uh, 193. And when I use my compass, um, let's see, my compass here, seven degrees, that's about, that's about seven degrees elevation and the uh, the azimuth right now of the tracker is 193 so if I go to my compass and look at 189 190 November 18 190, okay so it is though working and uh, just needs a little bit of of uh, TLC on my end to adjust the the you know gimbal orientation uh, of this unit when it's done, it's not going to just stop until, you know, you got to stop it, but it'll start tracking below the horizon to where it's useless, but it'll just keep going. It's not going to go all the way to face the ground, but it's going to keep going. Eventually it'll stop. And um, you could also go on the, the web interface. You know, if you look at the web interface right now, it is still tracking, right? This is the, that's where it's at right now. Let's see if I can see that. 190 degrees and 1.75 elevation. All right, and that's the uh, data there. Now, if I just go like this and go to stop tracking, that's it, it stops. It's done tracking. So where do I go from here? Uh, the, the thing's done, where do I go from here? I am giving this away to somebody. I am kidding. How dare you? <laughs> All that time, I am not giving this thing away. And uh, no, but uh, I might have a couple parts uh, I'll give away if you need them, being I bought and bought trying to get this thing fixed. I don't know, I'll see what I got. But anyways, the satellite tracker is finished. Um, I don't know what more to say, man. My, my play, where do we go from here? My 9700. I want my Icom 9700 outside where I could play with the radio more and let this do the work for me. Play with the radio, write down the contacts because every time I'm out there, you know, with a hand, you know, KJ4 wise, yeah, I, I, I gotta play the video back to see who I even works. So um, the Icom 9700 will be a joy to be able to record the uplink and downlink as two separate files on the SD card in the radio. Then I can put that for video's sake 
in a video when I'm making a pass and you can hear just the audio from the radio through the tracker, not having to worry about the lapel mic here. And uh, that's cool. I could record a really good pass and play it back on the radio. I could watch the scope and adjust for the Doppler shift in satellite mode on the 9700. That's my original intent. When I got that radio and saw the satellite mode, that's why I wanted to build this. It's gonna be awesome, even for the sideband birds. Although sideband might be a little tricky with the polarization, it'd be a lot easier with a tracker like this. 7.3 guys, and stay tuned because you're gonna see this thing in action soon. This is KJ4YZI.